Hello and welcome. My name is Katie Walker. I'm an EFT practitioner, trainer and mentor, and I'm here representing EFT International. And I'm so excited because I'm joined by someone who I hold in such high regard and who I believe is the best in the field. Um, and I just wanted to introduce Dr. Peter Stapleton. And before I actually start speaking to her and giving her the chance to talk about her latest um, research findings, I do want to just highlight a few significant points about Peter and her background and why she's actually featured as a presenter for the EFTI Symposium, which is coming up in March. Her credentials are so impressive that I have only been able to narrow it down to a few because we'd be here for a long time going through it all. So Peter has 30 years experience as a registered clinical and health psychologist and is currently an associate professor in psychology at Bond University in Queensland, Australia. She is a leader or the leader in my opinion in the research for EFT, um, including the world first study investigating the impact of EFT in the brain through an fMRI study and has written a book, The Science Behind Tapping. Peter has been awarded many awards, one being in 2019, the Psychologist of the Year Award, but the list does go on. And as I said, we would be here for a long time if we were to go through it all. And for another year running, she's presenting at the EFTI Symposium. So Peter, wow. Oh, I'm going to ask you, <laughs> is there anything you haven't done? Because I also know, <laughs> in addition to being a very busy woman, you are a mother, a wife, and you have other interests outside of the work that you do. I'm not sure how you fit it all in. But today, what I would really love to focus on is and highlight is your what you are going to be speaking to about at the EFTI Symposium. So would you mind just sharing with us what would love that to. is going to be? Thank you. Thank you. I would love to. Um, I'm thrilled to be at the end of uh, an 18 month EFT randomized clinical trial where we have actually been uh, assisting people with chronic pain. So uh, we did have to pivot during the old pandemic and it meant that the trial was delivered online. So we had a couple of components of that. But in hindsight and looking back, it actually allowed us to reach a lot more people than rather than local. So I'm going to talk to you about what I am going to present. I'm going to hold the results, but I'll give yes. you a few little tips and hints just so that if somebody's wondering about whether to turn up on the day to the symposium, this might kind of encourage them to. Right. So with the chronic pain space and the reason why we have turned our attention after 15 years in the weight space with our clinical trials is one in four Australian adults suffers chronic pain, which means that beyond a period of recovery after an injury or, um, you know, perhaps it came about, the pain came about through some other means, the body should have recovered, yet people are still reporting chronic pain. And I can tell you in our trial, the average length of suffering chronic pain is 14 to 15 years. So oh, wow. that's the average. Some people are a lot more than that and obviously a few wow. less. So we know it's a really important area and yeah. we're really wanting to kind of explore this, which has been fantastic over the last 18 months. So here's what we've done because there's a whole lot of data. So we have had two arms to the trial and a computer randomly allocated people to these. Now we've had a trial where the whole program that we wrote to target it, a six week program was recorded. So they're all videos of myself and it's been delivered online self-paced so people in that arm of the trial have actually put themselves through over a six week they were drip fed so they certainly couldn't do it all in a week they had access to me in a forum so they could ask questions if they needed to but basically put themselves through that program themselves our other arm of the trial is the exact same program but people logged on every week for the two hour session and did the sessions live with facilitators. And I know even yourself have been involved in supporting those trials. Mm -hmm. So what we've been able to do is actually compare whether doing it self-paced, you know, with good quality and a, a program that we knew would target the right problems mm -hmm. versus being led and being assisted by people live, like proper therapy. So I've got those two arms. Now in this group that also did the live sessions, a sample of them were close to me on the Gold Coast. So they were local, which means they were able to have an MRI 
before and after the six week program. And we've looked at their brain changes and they also had their bagel tone measured. So they came into my office and I've worked with Stephen Porges team from Indiana University. And Fantastic. I'm hoping by the symposium, I do have a meeting with them in a couple of weeks to have a look at the impact of EFT on the vagus nerve activity. So that same group that did MRI did vagus nerve measurements. So wow. lots of data, like I said, we've had hundreds, uh, over 200 people go through these two arms, this clinical trial. So it's quite a, a large Big sample. Group. Yeah, mm. and I can tell you, we looked at the data in 2020 just to see where it was at. We had finished the self-paced version. We're now doing six and 12 month follow up So certainly our publications won't be ready till 2023. Mm -hmm. But the self-paced group last year, when we looked at the data, absolutely worked. Severity of pain, interference, quality of life, depression, anxiety, stress symptoms, uh, health quality of life, all were significantly, and I mean at statistical levels, impacted in the right direction. Obviously pain down, quality of life up. Yeah. And were slightly better than the live sessions. So the numbers to oh, date. Oh, isn't that, that interesting? Serious. We've since I run another 12 months of live sessions. So we are reanalyzing. But yeah. it told a story. It told us that absolutely these people, if there's a good program, they can put themselves through that, tap along, ask questions if they need to, and get the outcomes, which is what everybody wants at the end is a reduction in pain. So yes. So it's been, um, yeah, quite the journey and quite encouraging along the amazing, way. Amazing, amazing. So at the during, over the symposium and, and when you're presenting, you're actually going to give some of the, yes, the all statistics. Of the Brilliant. Yeah. I love that. And yeah. I have to say, I, I, I did do two lots of the um, trials and I do know someone was so, one of the participants was so impacted that she has now become an EFT practitioner. Wow. Look at she that. She was like... What she was experiencing was so um, shifted so significantly. She's like, I need to be knowing more about this EFT tapping. So um, we're so fortunate that you do do the research that you do. Um, I'm curious to know what drives you and the passion behind doing the research. Why, why do you feel it's just so important um, to do it? Yeah, probably uh, two answers to that question. The first yeah. is genuinely love what I do and the client outcomes that you just mentioned like I'm getting emails now we send out our six and 12 month surveys and say it's been six months since you did your program fill out my survey and I get the emails back and this happened in the weight trials as well where people and this is not just one this is handfuls of people saying I forgot I was in your trial till I got your email because I haven't had any pain wow so those we call them clinical outcomes not the statistical ones for a client, I mean, that's when I sit there and I go, this is why I do what I do. You know? yeah. So there is that. Um, the other answer to that question is ultimately, and I think practitioners in the field sometimes probably don't think about this frequently, research guides clinical practice. So all the therapy somebody goes off and learns, whether that's EFT, EMDR, anything outside, you know, in any of those fields, has been driven by the development of a theory that's been tested in clinical trials. So mm -hmm. they don't just sort of emerge the other way. Uh, and that's where we get the evidence from. So part of my passion, and I've been asked this many a times when I go to promotion interviews to get promoted, because they kind of look at me like, you know, they've never heard of EFT in their lives. And they're like, why do you do this? And I'm like, well, in order to change clinical practice with the technique that we know, we, we know works, we have to have that research behind us so that we get acceptability and we build that evidence base. So, so ultimately that's, that's why I do what I do because I want everybody out there to have access to this, not only from a consumer point of view, but for clinicians to know that what they're training in has been backed by that's, that yeah, level of evidence. And it, it is so incredibly um, powerful and um, I am so grateful for the work that you do because I know that often um, I've had to cite some your work and when people are sitting there going really does this is what have you just made this up and I'm like no I have not and here's the the data to prove it so thank you so much for doing what you do um, I do just want to ask because the symposium is um, being supported or is facilitated by EFT International um, 
how do you feel EFT International actually supports its community? Um, what, what would you say about that? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you know, from a, a clinical training point of view, the training that organisations like EFTI actually offer, we know are grounded in what we've researched and what we've mm -hmm. kind of come up with. So practitioners then that might want to come along and do training, you know, for themselves or to go on to become a practitioner can have confidence in the fact that not only, you know, do we have an organisation here that has a full ethical board that is guided by these principles that we're all adhering to the same thing, but the training itself is grounded in what has come out of the research. And I think, you know, that is what we want to be assured of when we're recommending that somebody, you know, goes to EFT International to do their training and then their mentoring process after that. So I've long been involved with EFTI in lots of different kind of realms and things like that, but but also with the research that EFTI themselves, like, you know, your current kind of presidents and research uh, directors and, you know, Pat and Jackie and Shoshana and people like that, yes. that are driving that level of acceptance in local communities such as the UK. So the NICE guidelines and things like that, that mm -hmm. they also embrace that. And that's where yes. we have a shared kind of collective that, you know, the more of us that come from that same space, which I believe we all do, mm -hmm. the more we're able to have an impact. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so just extending on that a little bit further, because clearly your standards um, and, and quality of work that you do is exceptionally high ethical, um, high integrity, something that EFTI does stand for in terms of how it represents um, its, itself as an organisation and its people and community. Why do you feel that for EFT practitioners that, that they should be part of that and working to those standards and those ethics? Yeah, I think, you know, everybody kind of is coming back in the field to, you know, that question of is EFT tapping evidence based, you know, what's the answer to that question and we're very close to kind of having a definitive answer there um, at, a, at a different level, but I think if practitioners keep in mind that as long as they're also practicing to the standards, they're following true certification programs and accreditation. They're staying in touch with the research. So yes. often people will do a training, but then for whatever reason are not connected. And social media is an easy way to do it these days because we have groups where you can actually get access to that. Yes, That then gives us the ability to share that when we go out there, whether we're working one-on-one, -on -one, we're doing a talk at a local library, we're doing a conference presentation. We're all staying relevant, up to date, and we're also using the shared language that we know will build the bridge. So, yeah, you know, I, I talk about this often when I'm kind of teaching my students too, that we've come a long way from different language in EFT and found better ways to describe it. And of course, you know, if people don't know what I'm talking about, then join these kind of communities in social media and things like that. Yeah. I'll give you a small example that this point that we often tap on for the um, setup phrase in tapping used to be called the karate chop point. And a movement that came out of the veterans affairs in the US has asked for that to be called side of the hand yeah. because it just gave that message of too much sort of violence. Yes, That's right. yes. So as a collective, yet we need that to trickle down to the practitioners out there. So just little things like that or, you know, different choices of words and descriptions yes. will help build that bridge much yeah. more easily. And by being part of like the EFTI community is, is right. where that information is going to be filtered down to. Yes. Um, absolutely. So we are so excited in terms of what to expect. So you're going to be talking about the results from the um, chronic pain trials, the results from the fMRI, scans. Um, I do just want to point out what you were just saying in terms of the, the research. I know that I had to actually reach out to you this weekend. I was running level one and level two. And one of the participants said, is there been a study on, um, I think it was self-harm. And I'm like, I know just the person to tap into. <laughs> totally inappropriately on the weekend. Do you have any of it? But you were able to, you know, whip up. And as you said, there are groups and what have you that that where we can get that research and it does just hold that that weight and and allows for that credibility and to really back what we're trying to do so That's peter right. i want to say thank you again for doing what you do and for doing the research and the commitment that you have to 
um, doing what you do and what you bring to the the wider the community the wider community. Um, so thank you so much, and I really appreciate your time. So know that you're a busy woman. Oh, my so pleasure. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing everybody at the symposium. Oh, we. I look forward to seeing what you what you present at the symposium. So thank you again. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. Thanks.